This Week in Radio Tech, episode 182, is brought to you by the Telos Zip 1 IP Audio Codec, remote talent, outside broadcasts, studio transmitter links, and convenient remotes with Lucy Live smartphone apps. The Zip 1 at telosystems.com. And now, our feature presentation. Twerk. Westwood One is coming back, plus wrapping up a big station move and tips for starting with video in the radio studio. All right, calm down. He says that to everyone. This calls for immediate discussion. What's up? Yeah. All your days are belong to us. From his palatial office of important business. Or in a choice hotel in a distant land. This is Kirk Harnack. Chris Tarr and Chris Tobin join me for a potpourri twerk show that honestly turned out pretty well. You're dialed in to This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack. I'm glad to be with you. Uh, this is the show we talk about radio technology and engineers' role in that. We talk about all kinds of things that, that build into radio technology. Sometimes we get really technical about you know circuits and, and how they work and, and, and philosophies and, and uh, ideas and modes of operation, all that stuff. Sometimes we just talk about the tools of the trade, what makes our jobs easier. And joining me for this show, a couple of our regular co-hosts, two of the best in the business you won't find any better. First of all, the best-dressed engineer in radio from Manhattan, New York. He joins us from his lovely home office. It's Christopher Tobin. Esquire. <laughs> cool. Listen to you. Why, thank you, Kirk. Yes, things are doing very well here. I'm having a good time. And I'm with the folks at Music Cam, and we do IP Codex, both audio and video, for full disclosure. Cool. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about in this show is uh, video with your audio, video for radio stations. We've touched on that a few times. Maybe we can touch on that a bit more. I think it's a, a subject that is really going to come to the fore. Um, and in fact, I've been working with a studio that's going to be doing some big time video with their audio soon. Also joining us from his home office in Muckwanago, Wisconsin, an engineer with battle scars galore. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Chris Tarr. Hey, Chris. Hi there. And my home office is actually my bedroom. We're not fooling anybody here. Everybody talks about my dresser behind me there. So, uh, yes, I am a uh, director of radio operations and engineering for 88.9 Radio Milwaukee. Also do contract engineering work across the state of Wisconsin. And I'm a contributing writer for Radio Guide magazine, among many, many other hats that I wear. And you have battle scars. I do. I have many of them. I won't show you where they are, but I have <laughs> I think we got an idea a few episodes ago. Hey, yes. uh... Yes. Our show is brought to you by Telos. Uh, that means my employer. Thank you very much uh, to the Telos Alliance for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right. We're going to hit on a few uh, news items and also talk about some practical uh, things having to do with broadcasting and broadcast engineering. So hopefully we can pass along some good tips. We'll also be watching the chat room. You can participate in the chat room. It's really easy. Uh, if you're watching this or listening live, uh, jump right now over to gfqlive.tv. GFQlive.tv. You can participate in the chat room anytime, any of the GFQ shows. Of course, we'd love it if you come into our show. And on your screen, up will pop a chat room. You can give yourself a fancy nickname as long as it's clean. It's a family show. And uh, you can participate there by asking questions or giving answers. That would be uh, very nice as well. All right, let's hit a couple of news items real quick. One of them, Dial Global becomes Westwood One. What's that about? Chris Tobin, you, 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 uh, I think you used to office in a, in a building uh, associated with these folks or uh, had something to do with them. Dial Global becomes Westwood One. What, can you uh, add some insight? I, I wish I could give you some insight. I did at one time work for Westwood One prior to the Dial Global purchase. And um, in the building, the building was the CBS Broadcast Centers at the time. Westwood One and CBS Radio had a uh, management agreement, so we worked hand in hand. But uh, I left shortly before the Dial Global folks came on board. Why they're going back to that name, I don't know. I heard about it today from a friend of mine, and I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." They I also, I think, hmm? didn't Go ahead. isn't Cumulus who who bought uh, Dial Global? Yeah, Cumulus, I think it was. Yeah, and, and now the Westwood One name is is a a, a well revered uh, name. Uh, uh, was yeah. it Norm Pattis that started? Norm Westwood Pattis, One? yeah, he started. Yeah. And Westwood One was well known for its uh, live concerts, uh, mm -hmm. the music shows, uh, various things. The guys on the West Coast in Culver City uh, were geniuses at a lot of the works that that was done. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of Ron, and I can't think of his last name. Uh, he did a lot of the work on the Westwood One truck. We actually, uh, we had a production truck. You would, you would see at many events, sports events as well. 
Yeah. Well, the the story from Radio World uh, just came out. Um, was it today or yesterday? Yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Uh, it, it's uh, Dial Global CEO Paul Kane says, by reclaiming and reviving an iconic audio brand name, we are not changing who we are, but accelerating the great work we are doing to contribute to the growth of audio. Well, first of all, as a CEO, that's a nice statement to make. Uh, you know, it's very PR-ish, and, it, and, and you know, it should be all true. Uh, the program syndicators is expected to revive its former well-known name in the next few days. Consumers and Westwood One partners can expect to see a new website, social media presence, logo, and marketing materials to reflect the new, revived, Westwood One brand. Chris Tarr, thoughts? Uh, not many, actually. <laughs> you know, with, with consolidation the way it is, it doesn't surprise me to see things like this happening. Uh, I thought it was interesting that Cumulus made the play. Uh, you know, really, uh, you know, and in the process, uh, the one thing that didn't get talked about a whole lot because it was kind of a minor aside, but to finance the purchase, they sold a bunch of uh, their smaller market stations off uh, to Town Square, which kind of changed some dynamics uh, just in the playing field of, of broadcast, which was kind of interesting. But uh, you know, I think that um, you know, I think it was a good deal for for Cumulus. I think that they've been really itching to kind of grow that presence. So uh, you know, it's it, it'll be interesting to see how that changes the landscape because now you basically you have two: you have Premier and and you have Westwood One, and that's about it. If you want uh, want content, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. You know, there is some opposition from the talk radio network to um, well, uh, either to the I'm sorry, I don't know if it's to the name change or to the acquisition uh, as a whole. Maybe it's to the name change, but uh, uh, talk radio network is feeling squeezed by. Uh, um, Cumulus uh, purchasing uh, Dial Global, so maybe their objection is to the, the purchase itself. I'm not sure there's anything they can do about that. Um, TRN has a you know a, a bevy of good programs, uh, but uh, I'm sure they're they're feeling squeezed. And and I, I th we're we're certainly seeing more and more that uh, companies like Cumulus are not playing their own are not playing other networks programming. So a lot of cu uh, Cumulus stations stations that used to be something else besides Cumulus um, now they become Cumulus and then they drop uh, syndicated programs that come from their rival Premier owned by Clear Channel. Right. Well, I was going to say, certain, one of the, that's one of the things that concerns me about <clears throat> excuse me, these radio operators owning the syndication companies because you do run into that where, uh, you know, there's some, I would almost say, could borderline on anti-competitive situations where, uh, you know, you lock somebody in and, you know, the parent company buys a radio station in that market and all of a sudden they shift the programming over. So, you know, I, I know that they're very careful about that, but I do think that that's a valid concern as, you know, you've got... Uh, now the two largest radio groups also pretty much owning all the syndication. So if you're one of their competitors and you're in a market using their product and all of a sudden they decide they want to do it, well, then, you know, there's the ability to cancel those agreements and, and, and those sorts of things. So I do think, you know, back in the day when Westwood One was really Westwood One and, you know, Dow Global was Dow Global and, you know, you had these, these independent entities, they kind of dabbled in ownership, but... Uh, you know, not to you know, not to a very very large degree. So they were relatively independent and didn't care who you were owned by as long as you you know cleared their spots. Uh, you know, I I don't know that that is going to be the future of syndication. So uh, here's the story: uh, opposition emerges against Dow Global sale to Cumulus. So I guess the sale's not may not be consummated. Uh, opponents of the 260 million dollar sale of program syndicator and radio service provider Dial Global, now renamed Westwood One to Cumulus have begun to express their concerns. Talk Radio Network Enterprises and its affiliates, Talk Radio Network FM, Talk Radio Network Entertainment, America's Radio News Network, National Weekend Radio Syndications, and Talk Radio Network Operations, kind of all sounds like the same thing, uh, oppose the deal. The company has a pending lawsuit against Dial Global in New York and Oregon, alleging that the rival company violated antitrust laws. In a statement, TRN said over the past five years, Dial Global has become a monopoly uh, engaged in a long list of illegal and unethical behavior, including failing to pay us our share of advertising revenues generated by our programming. Wow. Uh, although failing to pay sounds like a separate lawsuit than, uh, than being against the, uh, the sale from one company to another. Um, but what about uh, – let's think about this as it applies to, to television – would you object to the uh, ABC Monday Night Football not being uh, on CBS? Isn't that the, kind of the uh, same thing? No, not really. I mean, I, no, I, you no. know, it, 
it's not really the same thing because you've got ABC is is ABC, and yes, they have a couple of owned and operated stations, but they've always been ABC. So, you know, you're not going to see ABC coming into a certain market going up. You as an ABC affiliate can't run it because we have something else. So, you know, generally, it's they're already an ABC affiliate. So, um, I don't see that as being you know what I'm talking about is the fact that you've got such a high concentration of radio stations owned by one of those syndicators that you know you. You know, they're not really, you know, are they syndicators and are they going to actually fairly make their content available to anybody who wants to sign an agreement? Or are they going to put it on all their stations and, oh, by the way, if there's a market where we don't really care, then yes, you can have it until we decide we want it. And that's kind of what I want to see, you know, how that plays out. And in, in, in the network world, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a different comparison because it's okay, kind of so always been that way. You're saying it's not apples to apples. Chris? Tobin, what were you about to say? No, I, I agree with Chris Tarr. It's not apples to apples. The problem with network or syndication in radio is that in order for you to make money at syndication, you've got to clear the show. And what's happened over the years, because of, again, the business dynamics, some of them I would call somewhat ridiculous, have forced um, syndicators to buy uh, radio groups so that they can push their product onto their own that operated, as it would be called, uh, uh, operations. Back in the day when I worked for two of the radio networks that were out there at one time, we were running into the problems where the affiliates, the owned and operated stations, stations actually owned by the company that ran both the network and radio stations, started to allow the local stations to not carry anything or you know, said, no, you don't have to do anything with us. Forget clearing shows. Just uh, do what you want. Now the network is stuck. It's like, okay, how do we clear the shows that we've all built? And over time, things just fell apart, and that's, what, that's where we are today. So, this cumulus okay. purchase yeah. and yeah. moving everything around, to be honest with you, if you read the, the financials, and the, the fundamentals of these companies right now, all of them, they, with the exception of CBS, which is probably the only one with positive cash flow and actual money in the bank, yeah. these companies are so over leveraged and the, um, the, uh, the, 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 what do you call it? the investors behind them, matter of fact, Oak Tree Investments is behind, I think, both Clear Channel, Triton. Globe, Dial Global, and I believe Town Square Media. So, you know, the CEOs that have been put in place by these companies came from the investing company, the investors, you know, the cap eventualists, whatever you call them. So I, I don't know. I'm suspect to this whole thing. I suspect probably six months from now we're going to see a big shakeup and things fall apart some more. I mean, here's the other thing with the with the with the operators owning the syndication deals. I, I, there was just recently a situation where a station was carrying a premier format, a premier for, uh, sports format, yeah. and all of a sudden, um, you know, they Clear Channel put a station on, and they decided they wanted to carry that format. So they, you know, said to the other station, "Hey, 90 days, and it's done. We're we're moving, changing to a different station." you have to find something else. Well, you know, here's a station that kind of built its, its, you know, its, its operation around this particular network under the impression that, you know, they were going to have it for a while. And, you know, what happened is, again, the owner also owned radio stations and said, yeah, we're going to move it. We're going to put it on one of our stations now. So sorry. And, I, I, you know, that, I have a problem with that. You know, I, I don't, you know, I, I think that, you know, As although you there's a contract and, and, you know, there's a contract and they did, they got out legally and, you know, gave the proper notice and everything. But, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, it, it's, you can't, it, they want to have their cake and they want to eat it too. They want to have this content for their own stations, but then offer it to other stations in places they don't want it. But on the other hand, if we do want it, then you got to, we're going to take it back. So, you know, Whatever your problem, that might. Yeah, but would you say so. that a company like Clear Channel or Cumulus? Uh, what if they own stations in a market and don't take their own shows? Isn't that not eating your own dog food? Isn't that isn't that uh, you know not having confidence in your in your own shows? And by the way, the stations who are affiliates, they have the option anytime too to drop the show. So maybe maybe your premier and you've got a sports show, or maybe your CBS and you've got a sports show, and it's on in a big market, and that big market station uh, one day decides, you know what, we're going to give you our 30, 60, 90 day notice, and uh, we're going to do do our own sports or pick up another sports network. In other words, it, it works both ways. And then Chris, I realize it, it it looks like you know the big guy beating up on uh, on the little guy. Let's say I was in Jackson, Tennessee, for example, and I was a small mom and pop station, and I've been carrying Rush Limbaugh for the last 12 or 15 years or so, and then Clear Channel comes in and buys a few stations in my market not mine and they move and they they force me to give up rush and move him over to his station is that is that fair well it's 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 contractual it's a risk you take all the time but the station that had him for 12 or 15 years could have dropped him anytime too 
Well, that, but that's that's a different that's that's different. If I drop them, then you know there's there are other options available to the syndicator. If the syndicator comes in and now is competing against you, you have cleared the syndicator show for twelve years, and now all of a sudden they decide they're going to use it to compete against you. And this wasn't a little station we were talking about, Kirk. This is a large station that this happened to. So you know it, it happens all over the place. So and that's what I'm saying is that's why I have a problem with the owners running the syndicators. Back in the days of the Westwood One, yes, you could get out and Westwood One would be having some problems if they lost you as an affiliate. So what would they do? They would work it out. They would they would make that they would make the the deal good for everybody. This deal is particularly one sided. You want our content, you play by our rules, and if we don't want you to have it, buy. I think that's a problem. And and I don't think that that's fair. And I don't think that that's right. Re, you know, regardless of how it's written in the contract, doesn't make it right. And and doesn't mean that it's a good plan. So I do think that there's going to be some there, potential there for some challenges, and I'd like to see that happen. I would like to see that become more fair. Or, on the other hand, then don't syndicate your stuff. If you want to be a syndicator and syndicate to your own stations, fine. But don't offer it up and then, you know, in the back of your head go, oh, you know what, that's all right, because someday if we decide we're going to compete, we can just take it back. Forget it. No problem. I think that's wrong. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, let's talk about something more fun. Tom Ray. He's not with us this evening. He's on the road right now, driving home from a visit with his new employer, Burke Technology. What do you think about that? Good for him. Yeah, yeah. that's great. It's a good product. I like it. I like. I love, I love their stuff. Uh, they're they're innovative. They think out of the box. Every time I've used any of their products, <clears throat> I put them in, put in the rack, use the transmitter side studios, and walk away and come back to it, check on it dust it off and continues to work. It's great. Well, I, I think Burke made a very smart move uh, by uh, talking Tom into working for them. Tom is a beloved figure in our industry. Uh, uh, he's a lightning rod, but you know he repels very few and attracts a lot. A lot of folks just love Tom, right? As we do on this show. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm glad for Tom. I want Tom to do, obviously, whatever makes him happy. And uh, I got a feeling that working for Burke is going to is going to pay the bills uh, uh, for for Tom. And I'm very glad to see him uh, uh, doing something that, that he that he likes and he's good at and can talk with folks about. So good good for Tom. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's, a, it's a very good move. They, you know, both both parties went out. Tom will do just fine. And hey, maybe we'll continue get a, being a lightning maybe, rod. Maybe we'll get a new sponsor on the show too. Well, we can, can beat him up on that. Can always hope. So here's a, a headline that came down the pike today. Um, uh, <laughs> you can tell this is PR. The first Toyota vehicles with subscription-free HD radio. I think all HD radio is subscription-free. Uh, audio traffic and weather will arrive at dealers. The 2014 Toyota Tundra, Corolla, and Sequoia. Featuring HD radio artist experience, traffic and weather forecast. These cars are now at dealers. The new Forerunner and Tacoma are arriving later this month. Uh, Toyota uses HD radio technology and Clear Channel's total traffic network to provide subscription-free real-time traffic and weather information via digital FM broadcasting. I guess this is good, Toyota turning out HD radios. Had they not before? I don't recall I hearing their name on the list, but I could be wrong. I think they did. I think this is uh, the the bigger one with you know, the artist experience information ah, and the ah, traffic and weather. Oh, okay. So, yeah. hey, you know, again, you know, I, I know there's a lot of people who are not fans of HD radio and they, you know, but any little bit. And I've always, I've said from day one, you know, this is exactly the kind of thing that should be happening and it's happening, you know, it's evolutionary versus revolutionary. I think as time goes on. You know, more and more cars are going to have them, and more and more people. I can tell you, I, I, and again, this is anecdotally, but you know, with with my station, our HD's been off now for, <laughs> unfortunately, for about two weeks because I lost a, a, a Mosley Starlink transmitter, had to go back for repair, uh, so that carried all my HD two and pad and everything. Um, I can tell you that when it's been off, we I, I was surprised, truly surprised, by the amount of email and feedback that we got from our website about the uh, HD being off. I was really tell floored. me about that. Yes. Tell me about that. Yeah, no, I, I you know because we um, we we run we're, we're kind of an unusual bird. We run uh, our same programming and we duplicate it on HD two outside of. Uh, once or twice a week, we run the school board meetings. It's part of our contract with Milwaukee Public Schools in the yeah. evening, and they can be kind of long. So we offer uh, our normal programming on HD2 while the school board meetings on HD1. Uh, so 
people enjoy that. And, and you know, surprisingly enough, as, as you know, Kirk, a little bit about our station, we do a lot of local music. We're, we're primarily a music station. We're not like NPR or anything like that. So people really rely on pad data and that sort of thing for uh, the information what we're playing. So um, I, I would estimate we probably got about 20 or 30 emails uh, within a, a day or two of the HD being off. So there are people out there that, that use it, um, you know. And and but I mean we are also our our audience is kind of in that um, demographic too that would have that kind of technology. We have fairly techn- uh, technologically advanced listeners. In fact, I have a story I'll tell some time of uh, one of our listeners who built a Raspberry Pi radio that was tuned to our station, and uh, <laughs> you know he actually you know put the logo on it and everything, and it just streams our radio station. He basically just made a streaming radio to listen to us. Uh, so, you know, so it doesn't surprise me to hear that, but I, I am glad, I, I think again, that, you know, HD radio isn't going to set the world on fire. I think we kind of shot ourselves in the foot with the launch kind of, you know, m- promoting this as the, you know, the, the cure all to everything. And, and in reality, people aren't going to rush to buy new radios. They're going to replace them as they, they need to. And I think the people who sample HD radio like it. They enjoy it, and you know the next time they go to buy a radio or buy a car, uh, you know they look for that, and and that's where we're we're building that, you know that that listenership to HD. So this press release includes some data that I haven't visited in a while. Maybe you'd be interested to know that uh, there are now more than uh, twenty two hundred digital stations on air. Uh, I guess that's HD ones. Uh, over fourteen hundred and fifty HD two. HD3, I guess that's the combined number. HD2 plus HD3s equal 1,450 um, that broadcasts fresh new content that can only be heard with an HD radio receiver. 33 automakers have now publicly announced plans to incorporate HD radio tech in 170 plus models by this year end with more than 80 models featuring HD radio receivers as standard equipment. Well, that's pretty good. I mean, it seems like Ubiquity turned uh, from technology focus to marketing focus which they had to mark, uh, focus on marketing uh, to get sure. radios and, and all these cars so well, you know one of, the co- I, one of the one of the cool things we're going to be doing hopefully we'll have an announcement you know, probably won't be this year yet but but next year we're talking about launching uh, um, a, a third channel of all local music uh, but put together by high school students uh, you know, we'll, we have, yeah. and, and we can talk about this later as we talk about my building project and how it's going. But you know, we actually you know have the facility there to bring people in to record the the tracks and record the shows and everything, and we'll put them on the air on the HD three, and it'll all be produced locally and and by students, awesome. and it'll just feature local music. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I had a really bad thought while you were talking about the school board meeting that you're required contractually to carry. And that's, I mean, that's a good relationship. And it is important that school board meetings, you know, get put out and are available for people. I understand that. But I can just hear your answer right now. On 88.9 HD2, the school board meeting, on 88.9 HD3, we have a recording of paint drying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. so bad. <laughs> So okay, eighty eight nine. You're a community station, but you you do HD. Just not at the moment. I get. I realize you're fixing that. Right. Um, but you do HD. You, do you an HD three yet? Is is that what's going to be possible? No, that's, what, that's what I was talking about. That's the that's the student station that we're looking to put together would be an HD three. Yeah. Cool. So um, next quick topic: Who's listening at work nowadays? Edison Research President Larry Rosen intends to cover when he presents the results to a new study at the upcoming radio show in Orlando that is coming up uh, next month. 26% of people, or is it this month? That's, it's, it's this month, no, it's right? Yeah. this month, I think, September. Yeah, this month, yeah, later this month. Okay, around the, oh, the 18th, 19th, 20th of September. I gotta make sure I got my bought my plane ticket for the right time. 26% of people listening to AMF and radio at work use headphones or earbuds according to Rosen, and the numbers higher among the younger demo. Internet radio will be part of the results as well. Now, okay, so if, they're, if they're using earbuds or headphones, they're, they're not getting PPM data on this, are they? How do they determine who's listening at work on earbuds, on earphones, uh, when, they're not, when, when they're not in the portion that are, are not streaming, the AM and FM radios? Any idea how they estimate that? I don't think they do. I don't think you can. I don't think you can, really. I mean, yeah, if you have earbuds, the... 
the belt-mounted uh, PPM meter won't pick up uh, any audio. Yeah. Uh, and if you're well, streaming, is- then you get the streaming stats, but that's different. Well, I I, this is not Arbitron. This is Edison Research uh, coming up with, with uh, the study. You, you know what they probably do? It's probably phone calls. They, they probably sample offices. They probably well, have how- a database and just ask people. How are they going to get people to answer the phone if they're listening with their earbuds? <laughs> oh, it is. There's somebody. You'd be surprised. These guys, these researchers can find ways to <laughs> skew those numbers. Oh, the yes, they like- can. They will hunt you down. <laughs> oh, he, he didn't yeah. answer. He must be listening to the radio on his earbuds. Check. <laughs> Check. There you go. You see? Now you understand. <laughs> okay, I got it. I got it. All right. Well, if you want to find out more about that, uh, we'll be at the NAB radio show. All right. Cool. Hey, and speaking of NAB, um, uh, hey, for the past few years, I have had the distinct pleasure and pain <laughs> of presenting uh, papers at the NAB show uh, in Las Vegas in, in April. And I got to tell you, it, if, if you're an engineer out there and you've thought about presenting an idea, maybe you have an idea or you've done some, some work that you want to talk about, uh, document it, and, and you know, just anything to share with other engineers that they can learn from, you ought to consider submitting a, a paper idea. It doesn't have to be all this fancy smancy, uh, uh, well, it's, I guess it's called a, a paper or a session, but uh, uh, here, I'll just tell you about this uh, uh, invitation. The NAB is um, reminding everyone that its deadline for speaker session ideas is uh, October 18th. So if you have an idea for a lecture, a panel discussion, a roundtable discussion, or a workshop that might be of interest to a broadcast industry audience, the NAB would very much like to hear from you. Uh, They are looking for keynote or lectures, uh, as I said, panel discussions, roundtable discussions, and workshops. They have all these different forums that could work for your idea, whatever you'd like to talk about. Um, So um, uh, check it out. You can go to the NAB dot, uh, is it dot com or dot org? Uh, And uh, dot org, I believe. Dot org and um, oh, or go to nabshow.com. dot com. Oh yeah, that's that's their show site. nabshow.com. dot com, and uh, you can um, uh, they have a page there to jigger the brain cells, as it were. Tell you what, I'll see if I can put that link in our show notes for this show. Uh, they they do want to know about this early because they they do read them over and they uh, they might turn you down and they might say yes. If they do say yes, uh, I think you get, a, you get a pass into the show, so it's a, it's a good deal. Hey, if, if you're, let's say you work for a station that is not willing to send you to NAB or provide you with a conference registration, man, you, you get accepted for a paper, and I, I believe you're in. And uh, it's a, so they won't provide your hotel room, but those are cheap in Las Vegas, generally. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris Tobin, you've given a paper or two at NAB, have you not? At NAB, no, actually. Um, oh, I've AES, done you? panels. AES, ah. I've been on panels at AES. Mm-hmm. Uh, the people, I've done those. They've been fun. Uh, being on a panel is actually very challenging as well. Uh, it's, not, it's not as easy. <laughs> not as easy as it may appear. You know, sitting in front of an audience of folks who are willing to uh, take barbs at you and uh, ask you questions that pretty much if you answer with the word no improperly or say yes, you're, you're uh, chastised and probably printed in some form or shape on a website saying, he claims X is wrong. One of the Chris, AES shows. Cause you you, you've, you yep. know what the audience is like at AES, right? How's that? The audi- the, how they're very particular and uh, very, oh. you know, it's about any topic. You pick a topic, whether it's microphones, audio in general, recording, and whatnot. And if you say something that just goes counter to the thinking, they get crazy. Ah. So, you okay. know, being on a panel is, is probably as difficult, if not more difficult, than presenting a paper where you just. Present it, talk, take a few questions, walk away. <laughs> gotcha. So a, a, a paper is, all, is more of a one-sided discussion. A panel discussion, I guess people in the audience feel free to challenge you. Yes, so you're yes. Okay. Hey, uh, Chris Tarr, you're giving a paper here in uh, Wisconsin, aren't you? Oh, I, I pretty much do every year. I'm not doing, uh, not doing one this fall. I just did one for the summer session, and I think oh, two yeah. years ago I did. Okay. So, yeah, I, I, I enjoy it. And, and usually... You know what's great is is you know I know all of the people involved with WBA. They, by the way, Wisconsin Broadcast Association has fantastic engineering seminars. Uh, all you know, people come from all over the Midwest for these. Uh, but they you know they know me real well, so they they tend to pick things that they know that I know really really well, or base them on articles that I've done for Radio Guide or whatever. So it's always nice to uh, you know get up there and and you know kind of informally do these presentations and it's usually stuff that I've done uh, done before but I know all the people so it makes it a lot easier you know to stand up in front of people that I know and, and do these things but I, I enjoy it a lot 
do people heckle you? Never, never, ever. I'm a funny guy. They laugh when I get up on stage. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you one way that you can make up for having a weak paper is bring ping pong balls, a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody in the audience here was in my session at NAB, my paper presentation, then you know what I'm talking about. We had 144, or did we have, no, we had two, we had uh, uh, 288, almost 300 ping pong balls in the room to pass around from one side to the other. And that was really interesting to see, uh, to see uh, several very large radio group directors of engineering and vice presidents of engineering and executive vice presidents of engineering passing ping pong balls as fast as they could. <laughs> that, was, that was fun. And then all that afternoon, people would bring me ping pong balls. Kirk, these got dropped on the floor. Oh, those are dropped packets. <laughs> so you can, you can make up for a week paper with ping pong balls. You have to hey, have uh, a hook. <laughs> yeah, you have to have a look. That's right. That's right. Hey, uh, you're uh, watching or listening to This Week in Radio Tech, episode 182. I'm Kirk Harnack, along here with Chris Tobin and Chris Tarr. Coming up on our show, here's what we have you have to talk about. Uh, Chris Tarr is going to update us more on his moving project and the things that he's had to wrap up and tidy up. You know, it's one thing to get the whole station moved. And then there's all those details. It's like it's like moving from one house to another and you know, you've got the bed set up and the stereo set up, and maybe you've got some stuff in the fridge, but you still have 200 boxes to, to open up. And so Chris Tarr is going to update us on what's been going on with, with his installation there. And Chris Tobin is going to talk to us about video for radio because that's, that's I swear, that's going to be big. If it's not already, that's going to be big. Our show is brought to you by my friends and my employer at Telos and the Telos Zip One. IP audio codec. This is such a cool box, and I got something here I want to show you. I'm going to, let's see if I can do this here. Uh, this is, you know, theater of the never done before. <clears throat> oh, yes, there's the, there's the website. You ought to go to it at telos-systems.com. And I'm going to show you here. Here we go. This is, uh, this is an iPad. And I'm showing you the iPad version of the Lucy Live Light software. Sorry about the focus there. My poor little uh, camera's doing the best that it can. This is the simple version, the Lucy Live Light version of our of, of the software. Uh, this is produced by a company in um, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, Technica del Arte. Uh, and uh, I have this program. I was just dealing with uh, a station today, KPay, K-P-A-Y. They're a sports station. And uh, they are using uh, this software to connect to the station and do reports. And I, uh, I, um, I, I can't show you the details, but I'll show you what happens. You just turn the software on, and I've got the station already preset in here. In fact, we can go to uh, the, the station. So there, there they are. There's the setup for that. And if I just touch one button, I'm going to connect the microphone, the audio from this iPad, and it'll be going to KPAY, and their audio will be fed back to me. Now, normally, that would be mix minus audio getting fed back to me, and there you go. It's that fast. It's that easy. Uh, let me see if I can turn the mic around quickly and let you hear it, and I'll stop it and restart it so you can hear how that works. It, was, it would be the worst thing ever if, like, just lightning was struck. All right, there it's off, and we'll give them a quick call over the Internet. And or you mocking the weather. Yeah. Really? There's yeah. no lightning at all. Look at her. I know. I don't want to... It looks like a Claire no, it's a poop commercial, I, I for will, God's sake. I don't want to get, I don't want to get on your... Now, sure, I realize that listening to a station over the Internet is no big deal, but the key here is that it's, it's very low latency, and it's easy for a, uh, a disc jockey, an intern, uh, someone who's setting up remotes to, to get done. They turn on the software, and literally, you, the engineer, have you know, pre-input the IP address or the URL, the URI in there and the port number, and so your talent goes out in the field and literally opens that, that, uh, that app and pushes one button, and they're on. <laughs> their, their, their voice is coming into the radio station, and there's the, the Lucy Live Lite version, which only includes the G.722 codec. Now, that's 7 kilohertz of audio. It's way better than a phone call. Uh, some engineers, and me included, think that, okay, it's kind of plan B or plan C in terms of audio quality, but it's way better than a phone call. And 
it's easy to do. Uh, you can get the full version of Lucy Live software. It's kind of pricey. It's uh, about $400, but it has some more functions like local recording, and you can uh, do some edits and play things back um, as part of your feed. And it includes a bunch more codecs, including uh, MPEG Layer 2, MP3, uh, uh, high-efficiency AAC. So you can send in, in, uh, in these other codecs that gives you 20 kilohertz of audio bandwidth quality. And it works over Wi-Fi, of course, if your iPad or iPhone or Android device is uh, on uh, 3G or 4G, it can work over, over those methods as well. Um, and so uh, you got lots of, lots of options, lots of ways to go do remotes uh, on the air. I'm not sure I'd use this for an all-day remote, but certainly for, you know, remotes from the county fair, from the Ford dealer, from the store, uh, from a station event. Easy to do. You can use uh, some accessories to, uh, I thought I had one back here. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Ah. There we go. Well, here's the simplest accessory, just a cable. This end plugs into your smartphone. It's the, you know, the four ring, uh, four contact kind of deal. And then you plug your headphones and your microphone in right here. This is a, obviously a passive adapter. There are also active adapters that give you a more headphone volume and can provide phantom power to your microphone if your mic uh, requires that. And also a bit of boost to the audio if you require that. However, the uh, Lucy Live software includes a mic volume control, so you may not need that extra boost. You may find that just a passive cable will work just fine for you. You can see a video on uh, YouTube of me describing how this works and how to set it up. If you will go to YouTube.com and look for the Telos Systems channel. I'd love it if you subscribe to that channel. We occasionally do add a new video to it. Uh, you can check it out there and see the whole video on how to make Lucy Live work with your Zip 1. Check it out on YouTube, youtube.com, and then go to the Telos Systems channel. And check out the Zip 1 at telos-systems.com. All right, thanks, Telos, for uh, sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, uh, we got a couple stories to get to from Chris and Chris. I wanted to mention, though... Um, Let's see. What are some what are some tools that you find are useful nowadays that maybe you didn't use or didn't have a few years ago? And I came up with a couple thought starters on here. Um, one of them is obviously uh, the smartphone. Oh my gosh! Uh, and the smartphone, especially coupled with software like TeamViewer or or VNC. Um, man, you can jump into computers and thereby you can jump into devices on your network using a smartphone and uh, and team viewer or vnc another thing that i find really helpful is uh this guy right here yes this is a paid for copy spin right oh my goodness i've brought several computers back to life with uh spin right that's a great tool to have um what else what else what else um that's that's it for me a couple ideas right there how about you guys? You got any tools that are favorites? Something that you may have used in the last few days? Chris Tarr? <laughs> I knew you were hinting at that. You're like, uh, anybody? Chris Tarr, maybe? <laughs> um, well, you know, there, there are a couple. Um, first of all, I've really learned to love, for various reasons, um, go to Assist. I have a subscription to that for, it's you know, you, you basically, the way the subscriptions work, you, you pay per seat per technician. So it's just me, but then you have unlimited computers for remote access, and I've actually done away with pretty much all of my really expensive, pricey KVMs because I don't need them. I can just run ah. my computers headless, and if I need to, if my computer that I really need to deal with, I can plug a monitor and a keyboard directly into it. But ninety nine percent of the time, I don't need to do that, and it does away with. Although I still have it, VPNs and things like that. So you know, when you're one guy trying to manage a whole bunch of uh, computers, plus. I have two locations. I have the MPS facility and, and the new facility, and I have stuff split between them. Uh, it just makes managing all that stuff easier. So that's that's one. Uh, and I've brought this up a million times before, and I'll continue to bring it up. My second best friend is my uh, two-meter HT radio, uh, my, my two-meter uh, ham radio, uh, mostly because, especially now, uh, Woshun, W-O-U-X-O-N, it's one of the Chinese imports, has a built-in FM radio on it. It's got a little flashlight on it. Uh, so it works really well for kind of monitoring things and, and, uh, you know, so I, I carry that with me wherever I go. Uh, that's a handy little tool. Yeah. Tell me that two way radio. F funny you should mention that because at our SBE meeting in Nashville just today, one of our members, um, brought, uh, brought a Woshun, if that's how you pronounce it. Uh, I want to say Waxon, but you're right. They, they say the X in, in Chinese as an 
S H, a Woshan yes. radio. It was a hundred bucks, and it it looked yeah. like a you know a four hundred dollar ICOM radio. And, uh, and in fact, their 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 kind of mid model, which is the one I have, I think it's the six, uh, actually is certified FCC certified for business band stuff too. So. Um, you know, you can open it up and, and use that uh, in, in those areas too if you have a license for that. So it's a, and what's great about them is, you know, like the battery was like 20 bucks if you want extra battery, you know, and just the, the crazy and expensive. So, and, you know, it obviously it, it has its, you know, there are some things it scans really slowly, things like that, but it's a pretty solid radio. And, um, you know, uh, it, you know, it's a good, I, I use that as kind of my, my disposal because I also have a really expensive digital D star handheld that I don't want to break, but uh, you know, this one is great for throwing in the trunk and, and, you know, just kind of carrying around. <laughs> Plus with the extra batteries, you know, being 20 bucks, I can carry a charge battery with me and, and uh, you know, um, have that available to me too. So I, I always pretty much anywhere, anytime I go anywhere, I usually grab one, you know, grab that HT and bring it with me. It's kind of like a Swiss army knife for things. I, look, I'm, I'm just, marveling at something. I, real quick, I went to Amazon. By the way, if you're an Amazon shopper, you ought to use the link that's on the GFQ network website that when you buy something from Amazon, our good friend Andrew Zarian, he gets a free drink. Hey, yeah. there you go. <laughs> so um, check it oh, out. And, 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 and it doesn't I cost you too, a thing. Before I forget, Pardon? too, uh, um, the other tool that I have that I, I actually did, uh, mentioned this in a presentation this summer I don't know if we've talked about it on the show. Surprisingly, is uh, those little uh, DVB, those little DV dongles, uh, and uh, software-defined radio. Uh, mm -hmm. They actually have spectrum analyzers for FM. You know, they're not accurate, they're not lab grade, but they're great confidence monitors. And essentially, what they did is, is some hackers figured out that these thirty-five dollar uh, tuner USB tuners actually have a really wide front end on them, and you can go down into FM. Some even go down to AM. Uh, all the way up to the gigahertz range, and they've developed uh, basically open source software to turn them into SDRs with, um, you know, spectrum analyzer displays, RDS, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I also carry one of those in my backpack wherever I go. Uh, it's you, a you mentioned other this before. You mentioned this before, and I wasn't smart enough to figure out how to use it. What was the 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 model or name of the one that you recommend? Well, it, what you should do is it's SDR Sharp is the name of the software, and they actually list. The generic compatible dongles ah, off the top of okay. my head, I don't know the names, but there's some. It's it's basically generic ones, and I got mine on eBay for twenty nine dollars. And you you, know, you plug it in, you run the software, and again, I mean, it's not lab grade accuracy, but if you're, you know, I can certainly when I open it up and like I was looking at a station that was running iBock, you can see the sidebands on it and everything. Uh, so I mean, it, it certainly is a good for confidence checking for sure. This is pretty cool. Uh, in fact, there's a, an example. This is at the uh, sdrsharp.com website, and you're exactly right. Here's uh, here's the software and recommendations for the radios, and they and they show this going to the AM band. They're showing an AM band uh, display here with uh, what looks like demodulated audio under each of the significant carriers that are, that's being shown. So, good suggestion. I like that. Maybe I'll, I, I bet I've still got the radio plugged in the back of one of my computers here and I gave up on it, so I need to go revisit that. I'm just not as smart. Um, by the way, sp speaking of going, going back to this, um, uh, these cheaper uh, two-meter radios, uh, Woshan, they have a bunch of these on Amazon for in the $100, $130 range. Here's one. How, how about this Belfeng, B-A-O-F-E-N-G radios? These Those are, are good these, too. They're thirty-five bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Th here's what thirty-one seventy-nine for a Baofeng UV five R. It's a two meter and four forty dual band ham radio for thirty-two dollars. Goodness gracious! Should I guess you should buy the um, U? Let's, let's see. Does the uh, Wachshon come with uh, a USB programming cable? Do you have to buy that? Separately? Uh, I think it's separate. Uh, you know what? You you can usually get it as a package deal, but even then, like okay. the cables, like ten bucks or something. I mean, the, their accessories are really cheap. Well, this is funny. The Baofeng radio, the two two band ham radio, 
even it's shown with the charger. I don't know if it actually comes with it or not. Um, it's 33, 33, 31 bucks. The cable for it's eight bucks. They're making their money on the cable. It's, that's what's it that's right. <laughs> They're making it up in volume. What they take. That's you know, right. That's it. right. Uh, well, there's, I'm, I'm sure ham radio suppliers uh, carry these. Although, hey, if I was a ham radio supplier, would I carry a thirty-five dollar two-way radio? Well, oh, I know. I, amateur electronic supply carries them. Do they? Yeah. yeah. Well, mm-hmm. there, you, there you go. That, that radio you're talking about is a popular radio among the amateur radio high-altitude ballooning uh, enthusiasts. I was at, oh. a, uh, at a conference dinner. No, it was a dinner for the, what is it called, the Radio, radio Group of America. They meet in New York City once a year, and they are highlighting um, the uh, what do you call it, high-altitude ballooning. And um, <clears throat> that was the radio they showed off of the telemetry, put in a little, you know, little... PCB, I mean, you know, PVC tube, and send it off in its merry way, and they track it, and comes back down to earth, and it stays intact. Gotcha. Okay, Th- this is for unmanned balloons, just you know the. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. So yeah, you can go, you it, go to it, the um, arhab.org website. It's the amateur radio high altitude ballooning. Oh, serious stuff. Oh, cool. I love that stuff. That high altitude, um, you know, measurements and seeing where the thing's going to blow around, and that's, that's pretty much. Thing. Yeah, that's it exactly. Yeah. And if you lose a $35 radio, who cares? That, that too. <laughs> very much. Who cares very much? Wow. Wow. Hey, I, I'm sorry we I haven't gotten to this yet. Let's, let's, uh, let's quit yapping about these things and jump right into it. Chris Tarr. All right. Last week we heard about your big move, and you really gave us a lot of good info about your challenges and the last-minute things you, have to do, you had to do and the tape and bailing wire that you had to uh, apply to a few things. What What's happened in the last week? All the wrap up, all the details that that people want. How come I have my, when my phone rings, it only rings twice before it goes to voicemail? You got that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And okay. it, it, it's very hard for me to, you know, I'm a nice guy, I'm pretty low key, but it takes a lot for me to go. You know what? We could always move back to the basement that we were in before, <laughs> and you know that's fine with me. I really couldn't care less at this point. Uh, but yeah, no, there's a lot of that, and there's also, you know, there's always. Things don't always go back <clears throat> and come back up and operate the exact same way as they did before. So, you know, there's a little there's a little bit of that. I'm still fighting a few little issues with uh, you know the automation system and kind of the way it was configured. And um, you know, there are, there are two schools of thought with this, and and I'm of the second one. The second, I'm of the se- the first school of thought is is that um, you know everything should go back exactly the way it was. And you try to make it as similar as you can for everybody, and and you know that's the comfort zone, and everybody's happy with that amidst all these changes. The second school of thought is is blow it all up because you know here's your opportunity, probably your only opportunity to get away with changing it. Uh, you know where people are going to understand that there are going to be th- some things that are inconvenienced, so inconvenience them a little bit and and rethink how you do things. And I kind of went with the second second school of thought, and you know <laughs> I, I did. Yeah, I know I did. I, I, you know, as much as, you know, it's been kind of a pain to kind of relearn some things for the people on the air, you know, I, I took this as an opportunity to kind of say, listen, we, we need to rethink this. Like, uh, you know, today we had a conversation about, um, we had beta brights in the studio that had, you know, on air and when the hotline rang and that sort of thing. I'm yeah. not putting them back in. I hate uh, beta brights. <laughs> really? I just, now, you know, people, people use these. I, I've never put one in. What don't you like about them? Just I the think just nothing nothing screams 1980 like a beta bright in a studio. I, I just <laughs> you right about that. You know. Thank you. So Thank so you. what I've done what I've done is is uh Yellow Tech makes these great new little uh light their poles with different colored lights you can snap onto them. And they're very they're very cool looking, but they're just a little they're like a little pedestal and you can buy light modules that snap in and then it connects to a a, a bus box uh, at the bottom that you can program with a USB and then it's got um, it's got relay inputs on them to make the lights do different things. And then you can use the computer to program flash rates and all these other things, and then it takes the relays and the lights do what you tell them to do. So what I'm doing is I'm putting those in, and I'm going to have red for silence, uh, you know, a silence sensor, yellow for the phone ringing, and green for the mic being on. And instead of having beta brights that are flashing on the air like it's 1991, you know, they'll just be this nice little pull in the corner of the the console that just it'll light green, it'll glow green when the mic is mic is on. So, uh, you know, there's things like that. Things like I, I took this opportunity to go through uh, our Axia nodes, and my uh, the previous engineer ran 
everything through Axia. Uh, you know, just things that we would never, ever, ever, ever use. And yeah, I just said we're not hooking that up anymore into Axia because nobody cares. Nobody's ever going to use it. So, uh, you know, I cleaned up some of the paths and, um, you know, I did things like, you know, as Axia users know, you know, you no longer have to daisy chain equipment. And so, you know, like, for example, I have a compeller. So this time around, I did the compeller in and out in a node so that I can, you know, I feed my programming through it, but I can take the output of that, of the uh, the compeller and feed it to a whole bunch of different devices rather than just the last thing in the chain and having it loop through. So, you know, things like that. Um, but then there's the building issues. There's, you know, doors that don't close correctly. And, and you know, I'm having the HVC guys come back because, uh, you know, one of the rooms is way too cold or, you know, there's a, a, a ceiling vent that's rattling. Um, however, the, another update uh, that I, I'd like to share is we had our first performance uh, yesterday in our performance studio, and it was fantastic. It was uh, Michael Frati and Spearhead. We had 100, close to 100 people in the audience, but it was the first test of my design for the performance space, and I, I'm happy to report that it performed fantastically. Uh, the acoustics were perfect. We had a brand new Axia node that fed our audio in and out of the room. Uh, we didn't have any breakers trip with all the amplifiers and stuff. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's a little wins like that. You know, it was funny because we were all kind of sitting in our, our studio, which has a nice huge picture window into the performance space. And we're listening in the monitor as we're hearing this perfect sounding audio coming from the stage where everybody's dancing around and we're watching it happen, but we can't hear it because it's so soundproof. We're just hearing the feed from, from the mix down feed through Axia. But it was like the program director, a couple of the DJs and I just looking out the window going, this is going on in our house. This is unbelievable how this is happening. This is, it was just, it was fantastic. So it was great to see, you know, as, as I like to say, you know, everybody was, you know, pat me on the back and everything, but I just kind of sat in the back corner. And I think it's true, you know, when I tell people as an engineer, I, I really get more of a kick out of it, watching everybody enjoy it, you know, having it work and, and watching everybody have fun and the performance going on and people not knowing all the work I put in ahead of time, you know, the, the weeks and weeks and weeks and late nights and everything, uh, you know, that kind of made it worth it. You know, I just kind of sat back and went, this is why I do this. You know, it's it's fun to watch everybody else having a good time. So uh, I guess long story short, uh, you know, it, it went well. We had our share of problems. We had the automation crash. We've had, you know, we still have some bugs, um, you know, and I still, for some reason, still don't have a doorknob on my tech, uh, my rack room, my operations center. Uh, I do need to go back. And unfortunately, my plan for really neatly, lacing wires and things kind of went out the window when the automation crashed and we had to quick get everything put together. Uh, so I have to go back and do some of that. Um, but, you know, it, it wasn't too bad. So, yeah, I, you know, we're at the point now where we're in there. We've been in there now. Uh, this is the end of our second week. Uh, we've had no major failures or anything. Knock on, knock on wood. Um, everybody is kind of in their new home. We still have boxes that we're unpacking. I finally put away all my boxes of uh, wire, spare wires and you know, the, the boxes of the IEC power cords that you tend to have flying all over the place. Um, so I got all that done. We're still waiting for our elevator. I've lost about eight pounds in the past few weeks from climbing up and down the flight of stairs, uh, which is not a bad thing. Uh, so, yeah, so we're, we're, we're just about done. But um, it's just it, it's great to see because we are a community station. You know, we, we, we exist for... Uh, you know, the, the, the people of Milwaukee and the musicians of Milwaukee, and artists of Milwaukee. And, you know, we do these, even today we had another performance. We didn't have a, a, a crowd for this one, but it was a live performance that we put on the air from our performance space. So we're unusual for a radio station in that we truly are kind of a public media outlet. You know, we invite people to come and come by and visit us. I mean, they paid for the building. You know, we, we did the fundraising for it. Uh, so we have people coming in and out. We've designed the facility to do that, to allow people to come in and out and participate without actually getting into our space. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's fun to watch people walking by the street, stopping to look in or or coming in to wander just kind of a little bit in the in the public space in the lobby there to see what we're doing. And and you know, it's the comments that we've gotten on our site so far have been 
you know, really, really positive about people coming and really enjoying the fact that they can just walk by and wave and see what's going on. And, you know, we really do have this kind of public front now, uh, whereas before we were in a basement of a public school building. <laughs> you can invite your friends over now. Right. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, like I said, it's, it's really neat. Um, just because, you know, you, you think of radio stations as being this, you know, these fortresses, you know, the t- the local TV station, you're not going to just go wander in there, you know? Ah, uh, well, uh, yeah, yeah. But we designed our space where, you know, we do have secure areas where you need a key fob or whatever to get in. Yeah. But, you know, during business hours, you can kind of walk into our the front of our building and kind of look around. There's a coffee shop and, you know, you can is, walk. Is that open yet? Uh, opens next week. So there, I okay. got to go. I'm wiring the sound. In fact, here's one of the nice little side gigs is I, the, the manager of the coffee shop said, hey, uh, you know, we want to run. Obviously, we want to run your radio station audio, uh, you know, in our in our cafe. Um, you know, can you get us the audio? And I said, oh, sure. You know, I've got an Axia note. I can throw some audio your way. And he's like, well, you know, uh, if you could help me hook it up, I could get you a pretty substantial uh, gift card for the coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it's sold. I'll take it. You'll have all the audio you will ever need with all this. Um, but uh, so, you know, but it, it is. It's one of those things where, you know, there people can kind of walk in and look around and, and, and see what's going on. And even when we were doing the performance, if you're a big Michael Fronty fan and you couldn't make it into the, you know, you weren't you weren't on the list or whatever, you didn't make it in, be able to get into the building to watch the show. If you're walking down the street, you were going to, you'd hear it along the sidewalk and you could stop, look in the window and watch from the from the street watch Michael Franti perform and listen to it. So um it, it's it's really kind of cool. It's a, it's a really neat place. Awesome. I appreciate that update and uh, I hope we'll, you'll get more as uh, as you get a few more things finished up there and 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 more innovative ideas. I know you, it seems like you put so many in, innovative ideas into the space you've got, but I'm sure you'll you'll think well, of more possible. I mean ideas. I can yeah, well let me and let me run down. I don't know if some of the highlights. We got uh, we have a green roof with a performance space uh and yeah. we actually got that we got a uh, that was partially subsidized by the sewage district because it controls runoff and so it, it saves them money and then we got a rebate on that. So you know, up on the roof, we've got a green space plus an area there for performances. We've got a performance space on the first floor. We have uh, actually in our in studio for when we have just really small uh, artists coming by to play you know, to do an interview or maybe play an acoustical set. We have a small stage in our studio. Uh, upstairs, we have three smaller studios uh, available for people to use. Uh, but the the performance studio is kind of cool because it it can take on many different shapes. We can take the staging down, and we can do an art mm. gallery in it. We can do talks. We can do you know any kind of community type events there. So, uh, and then of course using Axia and and you know the the Zip One and and the Telos gear to kind of tie it all together. You know I can anything that goes on the building can be brought up anywhere. Uh, thanks to the Axia nodes. In fact, I bought a, a few extra nodes as part of this project to put them throughout the building, uh, so that when we have these performances going on, you know, maybe we don't put them on the air, but we want to feed them to the coffee shop. No problem. You know, mm-hmm. I have those. I have that audio available through the Axia network, and they'll be able to select what they want for for audio. Uh, if we want to have them in and record, but not on the air, that's easy too. I can send the feed from the performance studio to any one of the uh, any one of the the studios to record it. So. Uh, you know, voice over IP with QoS tagging for our phone system, fiber into the building. Uh, you know, we, we set up a VPN to our old facility. Here, here's another good one. We, we have, uh, we use Content Depot for a show called um, World Cafe that we run in the evening. Mm-hmm. And the way uh, NPR works is that gets downloaded on a receiver via satellite, and we have to take the audio off of the receiver. Well, we didn't have, we didn't really want to put satellite dishes all over the roof of this place because of the green roof, obviously. So uh, we worked out uh, an agreement with MPS. We leave our satellite dishes there. I now set up a VPN between our network and MPS, and I can access the receiver like it's right there and continue to download our content without having to have the satellite dishes on site. So, oh, nice. Yeah, there's yeah. A, there's, yeah, there's a lot of those, you know, cool little things that we thought about in the design of this facility uh, that. You know, just the little things, those little touches where, you know, uh, wireless access points that are, you know, planned out very well. I mean, it just was very well designed from the technical side so that, uh, as I said, one of the goal design goals of this was to not let technology be a barrier to creating content. So, you know, I don't want it to get in the way. I want it to be there. I want it to be everywhere. 
but I don't want it to be noticeable and I don't want it to be a barrier to getting done. I want to be able to say, hey, we want to have somebody in the stairwell playing a guitar while we're filming it from up here, you know, and go, yeah, no problem. We can do that. Uh, so <laughs> we designed the, the building to do that. Cool. Hey, oh, I, oh before we get to, to one last subject with Chris Tobin, in moving the station and getting everything working, did you have to visit Radio Shack? I did not. I thought maybe oh. I was going to have to, but uh, to be honest, you know, I anyone who knows me, I'm a very, I'm very much a planning to plan kind of guy, and so I mean, I really, I had a very good grasp of what I was going to need and made sure I had it. Although there was that one that I talked about last week with the DA converter, and I just happened to have one in a cabinet somewhere. I would have been sunk if that were the case, but that wouldn't have been a Radio Shack thing, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Wow. Hey, in our remaining few moments, uh, I said we'd, we'd talk for a minute, and maybe what we'll do here is we'll preview an upcoming show, because I, th I think this will end up deserving a whole show. There are some cool technologies for matching up uh, switching of cameras in a studio with switching of who's talking on the mic. Uh, I've seen some homebrew versions of this. There's also some very professional versions of this uh, out there, and uh, in fact, some are even used on, on national cable news networks, automatic uh, switching that put, you know puts other graphics on the screen, but Chris Tobin has plenty of experience in bringing video back along with audio from a remote or just from a normal broadcast. Chris, what are your your current thoughts? And maybe you can preview for us what what we might hear from you and and perhaps others on an upcoming show about video for radio for radio production. Well, uh, the first thing I would say we two of the sta several stations I've worked with in the past when we did video in the studio is. Um, First, look for your camera angles. I know this sounds crazy, but look for the camera shots. Go in the mm -hmm. studio or studios and say, okay, where do we want it? What do we want people to see? And do if you want, you could do the old take your index finger and thumb of both left and right hand, put them touching each other and create a square, a little square, so you get a, so to speak, four by three aspect ratio <laughs> looking uh, box. And, I, and mm -hmm. I say this because one project I worked on, we did not do that. The programming folks just went ahead. Got a bunch of cameras. I mean, you know, a couple thousand dollars of camera. Threw them up on uh, mounts and did this whole thing. And then when they fired up the video and started feeding it into the web server, we all looked at it and go, "Okay, I see the back of a micro arm for the microphone. Is that the serial number to the RE20? Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> oh, and then no. it's like, well, but no, you can see the jock. Yeah, but the depth of field is reversed. The the <sighs> microphone is actually in the foreground and the jock is in the background. <laughs> it doesn't oh. look right." So um, I, my suggestion, I just re recently worked with a college station that wanted want to do some video stuff, and uh, that's what we did. We actually looked for the camera angles first, and uh, it paid off. The second thing to do is you don't have to go crazy with lighting. Uh, the smart thing to do is you can actually pick up these uh, CFLs, you know, the uh, what do you call it? compact fluorescent lights. Yeah. Make yeah. sure you get the correct color temperature. Uh, color temperature typically for most studio stuff, for, well, I'll call it semi-professional, is about 5,000 degrees Kelvin, five, okay. you know, 5K. And if okay. you look on the bulb, you'll see it. It's typically some of the bulbs are marked as daylight, but look for the color temperature because some daylights are actually at 30, 3840 or 3800 Kelvin, which is not going to work. Get the lighting right. Keep it close to your subjects. Uh, and then with the webcams, if you choose to go web cameras, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with them nowadays because the optics are really good. Um, try not to do the three or four USB cameras into the motherboard mounted USB uh, ports consider the the extra expense not that expensive but getting USB controller cards PCI uh, PCIe slots mm -hmm. and give each camera its own USB controller so uh. when you work with the software you don't get stuck with Microsoft OS trying to f finagle I'll call it the universal plug and play protocols for the USB ports and all of a sudden your three webcams are working just fine we're doing great until your wireless uh, what do you call it? Mouse called for something on the USB port for the transmitter, and suddenly camera two went out. That is like the most notorious thing that happens. I've had mm. several projects mm. where it just fell apart. Did the separate yeah. cards, and it worked like a champ. Very inexpensive, simple, basic stuff. Now, if you want to get crazy from remote locations, now it's time to talk some serious hardware. You could get away with using a laptop, but you better make sure you uh, lock that laptop down to do just one thing. Produce video, nothing else. Do not, don't try doing any tweeting. Don't try to do any uh, instant messages. Nothing, just video only. 
that's broad strokes. I can get more detail next time we you know, get more into this. Uh, those are the basics. But you follow that rule of thumb for the real quick stuff, you can get something up and running in no time and it'll look really good. Um, well, but from remotes, it's going to be a, a mixed bag. It's a, there's several ways you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I suspect that we're going to see, in, we're already seeing some of it, but we're going to see more and more radio stations and content creators uh, streaming their audio, but then also having a, a link to stream a video of the studio or maybe of music videos that are playing that, that represent you know, the music that we normally just hear will now be playing the music video. Um, and I think engineers, are, uh, broadcast engineers like us, are going to be called upon more and more to provide some kind of video from the studio. So it's going to be interesting to, to find out about what are some of the tools available, what may be coming along, along the way. Um, how can you do this without adding any people to do it? If you can do the automatic camera switching effectively, that'd be interesting. If not, I mean, at, at our station in American Samoa, we have a guy sitting there switching cameras. Uh, but we have, you know, a little... Of uh, sub one thousand dollar video switcher switching some little you know lipstick cameras that are in the studio, uh, but there are other ways to do this on a on a much more professional basis. So, uh, in fact, coming up early next year, we're going to see some of that coming out of some Cumulus properties that are are pretty interesting. So uh, that's something that we'll have a head up, heads up on and uh, do a real show about that uh, in the in the, uh, coming up in the future. So we'll we'll do that. Hey, we got to go. To we're past yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. One thing to add: if you're going to do video from the studios. Make sure you find out who the person or persons are in charge of the video content. Sit with them and understand their, we'll call it the artistic creative view, what they're expecting. That will help you decide how to use the technologies for auto <laughs> yeah. switching, for manual switching of video, camera angle. I mean, it, it's interesting. You can take for, we take so much for granted in the visual world. But when you put a camera up, which is just, so to speak, myopic, it just sees one plane, you suddenly realize it's a whole different world. Hmm. Mm. All right. All right. Camera angles. I've, I've worked for a while just to try to get this one. It's only one camera. There you go. Uh, maybe Andrew, you know, Andrew can chime in on this. He's got cameras in his studio. So Andrew will be part of that show when, when we do that. Won't you, Andrew? I would love to. Good. I would love to. All right, guys. That's it for this week in Radio Tech. Thanks to Chris Tarr in Muckwanago, Wisconsin. Chris, where can people enjoy the fruits of your labor? Isn't there a website? Uh, well, you know, the best way to, to see what I'm doing is, uh, either Facebook or Google, uh, Google plus or Twitter. Uh, I also do run the site, uh, virtual engineer, uh, broadcast engineering.info. You can check me out there or of course, yeah. Twitter at the geek Jedi. Ah, the geek Jedi and, uh, Chris Tobin, where will people find you hanging out? I guess at, um, music cam, music cam, USA.com. You'll find out all the stuff we do there. Or you could just email me at uh, ctobin at musicmusa.com to discuss your finer points of putting video in your radio station or maybe adding some radio to your video. Good deal. And uh, also thanks to Andrew Zarian for switching and helping produce this episode and all episodes of This Week in Radio Tech on the GFQ Network, where all the fine podcasts live, except on Rosh Hashanah. Thanks, uh, Andrew, for being with us and switching the show. Uh, and thanks to Telesystems for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. That's all the bandwidth we can pill for this week. Another tort has propagated, and all the transmitters and audio equipment live happily ever after, thanks to the handsome engineer and his kind, benevolent care. We'll be back next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. This week in Radio Tech. Subscribe to iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Search for This Week in Radio Tech in the iTunes Store. Soliciting is strictly encouraged. If you like today's show, tell a friend. If you didn't like it, we were never here. Kirk Harnack's wardrobe provided by the Salvation Army and the Red Cross Disaster Relief Services. Hair and makeup provided by Penny Lope Garcia Hernandez Weinberg. He's unique, wouldn't you say? I just want to get it over with. This ends this transmission. Tango, Whiskey, India, Romeo, Tango. Signing off. Okay. <laughs> 